This session is different in, in that it focuses, as George says, on a particular segment of the population, children. They make up nearly 40% of our population. And yet children are often invisible in poverty research and in policy debates. So what I'm going to present here is a bit of a descriptive overview and also, despite what George says, an argument for paying attention to children as an important category for analysis and in the development of policy and interventions. Um, we don't have information in the General Household Survey about care arrangements for children, who takes care of children. So we can't actually follow them to link uh, children to the situation of, of their, of their caregiver, uh, caregivers in the household unless the caregiver is a biological parent, whereas in NIDS we can because the caregiver is identified. So that's really useful. Children across the world, and particularly in developing countries, carry a disproportionate burden of poverty. This is true in South Africa, and it can be illustrated by a simple numeric example. Here are two commonly used poverty lines. Let's look at the lower line, which is very minimalist, just enough to meet basic food requirements. Just over the half the population, 54%, lives below this line, according to Murray Leverance analysis. But if we compare co poverty rates for adults and children using the same poverty line, 67% of children are defined as poor, compared with only 46% of adults. If you look across income quintiles or deciles, we get a similar picture. Um, so if we take the population and divide the population into income deciles, we get this kind of flat line. Um, but if we uh, look at adults, you can see that adults are overrepresented in the upper deciles, while children are heavily concent concentrated in the lower deciles there. So what does this mean? It could simply reflect decisions about fertility. Those in the wealthiest households are least likely to have children, or they are wealthy because they don't have children. Uh, similarly, those in the poorest decile may, be, may decide that they cannot afford to have children, or they may be in the bottom decile because they are poor and yet they don't have children and so are not eligible for a child support grant with which to support their income. The point is that the distributions look very different for adults and children. Reports on poverty rates are widely available, but these seldom reflect the levels of poverty experienced by children in particular. As we have seen, separate analyses of poverty rates for adults and children show that children are more likely than adults to be poor. We can also see persistent inequality um, in, ch in, in, in child poverty rates across race races. So here we see uh, quintiles by race for black children and for white children. It's very stark. Um, it means that black and white children in this generation will grow up with vastly different opportunities. What I want to leave you with is that irrespective of how one considers children, there's a need to acknowledge and even prioritise them in policy development. It may be because of a moral imperative, which says that there's a particular urgency to addressing the needs of children because of the transient nature of childhood. It may be because we believe in giving realisation to children's rights, where the duty to provide for children is shared between parents and caregivers and the state, and this is made clear in various right instruments, including our constitution. Or it may be because we take a long-term view in which addressing child poverty is essential to addressing the structural roots and breaking intergenerational cycles of poverty. A whole cohort of children was born in 1994 and will turn 18 next year. What might our policies have looked like if we had thought in terms of generations rather than short-term targets? What decisions might we take now if we look beyond the immediate goals for 2015 or terms of office and thought about what we want to achieve in one, two or three generations' time? And in the meantime, what are the easy wins, the small things we can do to alleviate the circumstances into which so many children are born? Thank you.